Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get started. There's only a couple of us here. Well, let's see. Antoinette is checking in. So let me give her a minute. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to try to keep this down to about 45 minutes today, um, give or take. We'll, uh, we'll see. But um, if you have any questions while I go over some of these things, just feel free to, uh, to chime in and, uh, and answer. First thing I want to do uh, real quick is to show you um, on, the, uh, on Blackboard, the Tegrity audio links are going away. Uh, there will be something, and I was working with Alan Davis today, so it may not be exactly the way that it is right now, but uh, instead of going to the content section and seeing the um, Tegrity Audio Lectures, for exam one, two, three, and four, you will scroll down and there will be things like this. It may look differently, but it'll be something like this. Um, and there's some confusion with it right now because if you click on some of them like contracts and agency law, the only thing that pops up is consumer protection. If you click on corporations and business entities, it pulls up corporations the way it's supposed to, but no, actually that one works. You can actually click on it and it, and it'll work fine. Um, if you are, well, click on something like uh, consumer protection law and it gives you corporations part. Anyway, there's just, it's all kind of mixed up criminal law relay links. I'll have it. There we go. That's what I was trying to find. It actually has the folders separately like contracts and agency law where you can open the folder and it has the various integrity audio lectures there. But right now that one's a problem because if you click open folder on that, you can't click on the integrity audio lecture and have it open. So you have to kind of work your way around it by like clicking on criminal law and then when you get to contracts and agency law click add folder I know it doesn't make sense but I'll explain that later and then you can click on one of the um, one of the lectures and it'll pop up and do the way it's supposed to do but again I'm gonna try to get that straighten out so that uh, there won't be any problem with it. Also, I may be adding some video lectures in lieu of the audio lectures. Um, basically the same type thing, but just a, a little more reliable format that I've got control over better than, uh, than the system. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, in any event, let us, let's go ahead and, uh, and get to contracts and uh, agency law and I'm going to go ahead and work from the integrity audio lectures for the time being just because it makes it a little bit easier for me okay um, and we're going to be skipping a lot of these uh, Let's see if I can mute the sound on uh, on this. Yes, okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is, um, oh, I don't need to do the Tegrity audio lecture at all. What I'm going to do is come back to the PowerPoint slides. And here we go. And I'm going to be going through a lot of these things rather quickly because I'm uh, skipping pages because what I'm going to try to do is hit the uh, most difficult areas, the areas that I like to test on and that are a little more confusing than others. So just hang with me with uh, 
with this. Uh, I typically uh, will not test on, I think I mentioned this in the audio lecture, but I will not test on formal versus informal or express versus implied in fact contracts. Bilateral and unilateral, make sure you know those, the differences between uh, those. Uh, I do spend some time testing on things like what's the difference between a valid contract and a void contract. And students often get confused where we have something like a contract that, uh, for example, has a uh, legal defense like statute of limitations. It was a valid contract but the statute of limitations has expired. They can't enforce it anymore. Well, that's still a valid contract. It's not a void contract, it's a valid contract. The reason it's valid is it's valid, but unenforceable. Or you have, and I know I go into a lot of detail on this in the audio lecture, so I'm, and I'm not gonna try to duplicate anything tonight, but, um, you do have various types of voidable contracts, such as someone who is has not reached the age of majority. Uh, if they have not reached the age of majority, then uh, a minor is entitled to enter into a valid contract, but it's voidable. So voidable means it's a valid contract. It just might not be enforced for one reason or another. Um, let's see. Next thing that I want to cover is you kind of have to know this idea about an offer and how long it exists because we're gonna go into a number of different things like the mailbox rule. And on the exam, I'll probably have several hypotheticals about a possible offer being made and then maybe an acceptance, maybe a rejection, maybe a counter offer, and maybe a withdrawal or revocation of the offer. And it's going to be really important for you to be able to apply these rules and to determine whether there's still an offer that's living, breathing offer that's still existing. Uh, an offer exists until such time as it dies. And that's my terminology. It's not a, a legal term, but uh, I like to think of it as a living, breathing thing that can be accepted until it dies. And it dies in a number of different ways. One way is through a reasonable time. If you offer to sell me something and then three years later, I say, oh yeah, I'll take you up on that offer. Even if you remember what it was, that offer has expired because a reasonable time has elapsed. What is a reasonable time? I don't know. It's something between, you know, a minute and three years in most cases. Um, you usually kind of know it when you see it. An offer expires or dies if you gave it a certain time limit. Uh, I'll sell you my car by Friday, but you got to tell me by Friday. You got to accept by Friday or else I'm going to do something else. Well, Saturday comes and you try to accept, you can't accept that offer anymore because it has expired. It has terminated. It has died. So an offer dies from a lapse of a reasonable time or through a time limit that you give the offer or uh, it also dies if it is rejected by the offeree. If you tell me you want to sell me your car for $5,000 and I say, uh, nope, that's too much. And then I try tomorrow to accept that offer. You are free to tell me no, 
because I rejected your offer. And when I rejected it, it terminated it. It died. Um, and then the, the final kind of way that an offer might die, in addition to lapse of a reasonable time, lapse of a time that you give it, and a rejection of the offer, actually there's two more, uh, is if you revoke the offer. And most offers can be revoked before they're accepted. If I say, I will sell you my car for $10,000, and then you say, then before you accept, I say, now nah, I changed my mind. I'm not selling it after all. You can't then come back and say, oh, I accept your offer now. That offer is dead. It has expired. It has terminated. It has died. It's death. So we've got an offer expires by lapse of a reasonable time. An offer expires through a time limit that you place on it. An offer expires through rejection by you of the offer. An offer expires by my revocation or the offer or's revocation of that offer. <laughs> and then the last way, the fifth way that an offer is uh, dies and can no longer be accepted is if you make a counter offer because and, and here's really there's four ways but i'm gonna call it five just to make it easy to understand a counter offer is really two things in one and a, a counter offer is the offeree saying hey i reject your offer and i'm going to make you a new offer so it's really two things in one so it's really what we've talked about already it is a rejection of the offer, and that terminates an offer, and then it's adding a new offer to it. But you can look at it as four or five different ways. An offer expires through lapse of a reasonable time, through a time limit that the offer or imposes on it, through your rejection of the offer, of the offer, through the revocation of the offer, you're taking it back, or through a counter offer. So it's going to be really important on, for purposes of the test, not only to, do, to know this, but be able to apply it. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you examples of an offer that has been made. And after that offer has been made, then the uh, things will happen. You know, John makes an offer and then something happens. You might see that the offeree makes a counteroffer, or you might see that uh, a, a long time elapsed or something happens. So you're going to have to determine, hey, is this offer still living? Is it still breathing? Is it still something that can be accepted? So, um, so keep that, that in mind, and I urge you to spend significant time on, on that and kind of go through it, make up your own hypotheticals, um, as many of them as you can, because I'll have some on the exam, and you'll have to, to get uh, through that. Now, uh, I'm going to add to this in a couple different ways. Here's one, one way. That second bullet point that you see on slide number 19. It's called the mirror image rule. And the mirror image rule says, hey, if you're trying to accept the offer, you got to do so by matching the offer exactly with your acceptance. Now, what does that mean? Well, this is what it means. Um, I'm sitting here tonight, and I've got a uh, I've got a Dell Ultrabook laptop in front of me, and I've got a Fujitsu ScanSnap uh, scanner beside me. And if I say, "Hey, I will sell you my Dell Ultrabook laptop for five hundred dollars," and you say, "Uh," that's a deal, but you got to throw in your scanner too. Well, sorry, that's not an acceptance. It fails because of the mirror image rule. 
mirror image rule says that the acceptance must match the terms of the offer exactly. And in this case, it did not. You added something else to it. So instead, what you did, you didn't accept. It wasn't an acceptance. It was a counteroffer. And you know from my five minutes of talking about it already, if you haven't studied it al already, that that five minutes, uh, that, uh, that counteroffer that you just made constitutes a rejection of my offer and a new offer being made by you. So if, if I said you can buy my ultra book for $500 and you said deal, uh, but you got to throw in your scanner. Then uh, if you changed your mind and, and thought about it and you were like, I don't want to tee off Mr. Cartwright. And I think that was a good deal that he offered with his uh, computer in the first place. Oh, Mr. Cartwright, that's fine. I'll go ahead and buy your laptop for $500. I can say too late. Why? Because you rejected my original offer. It looked like an acceptance. You made it sound like an acceptance, but it was a rejection because the mirror image rule said it was rejection. Does that make sense? I know I'm kind of throwing a lot of stuff at you all of a sudden, but uh, these are the test question kind of things and the, the, the things in real life that come up that, uh, that result in in cases being in court, and I will make sure that you understand it uh, correctly. But if I'm going too fast, stop me, slow me down, ask me a question, something, and we'll we'll uh, we'll get it right. But I'm going to assume that you follow that, or at least have it enough where you can go through it after this Zoom class and uh, and get it. Okay, uh, and again, there's a lot of stuff here that is good information. It's valid information. And what I want to do here is um, there's the mailbox rule. We need to talk about the mailbox rule. I always test on the mailbox rule. It's fun. Uh, it's interesting. It uh, requires you to really think. And you know by now, I like questions that make you really think. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this until we finish, until I go through the entire uh, 37 slides. And we're already 24 slides, so we're almost almost there. Because there's a separate handout on mailbox rule, and I'm just going to go over it. Okay. Um, Here's something, that, and since I've got you you guys here, I'm going to make sure I benefit you, that I often ask a question on, and I suspect I'll ask a question on this test. And it's about consideration. Uh, you know, I, I, um, I went to law school in Louisiana. Uh, I took not only the Alabama bar exam, but also the Louisiana bar exam. Also took the Kentucky bar exam, but that's another story. But in any event, 49 states follow the same basic set of rules called common law. Alabama is one of those 49. The state that does not is, follows something called civil law, and that's Louisiana. So I had to learn both sets of laws, which is fine. And one of the things that's, a, that's different between civil law and common law is this whole idea about contracts. You know, in Louisiana, you don't have contracts as a, as a legal uh, concept. You have something called obligations. It's close, it's similar, but it's not the same thing as a contract. Well, in 49 states, you have this idea called consideration. And it says that, hey, for a contract to be valid, something of value must change hands between 
both the offeror and the offeree. Something of value. What is that something of value? Well, almost anything. There's an old Supreme Court, I'm mean, not Supreme Court, but there's an old case that just about every law school student learns in contract law where the judge says, uh, upholding a contract, that even a mere peppercorn can be sufficient consideration to support a contract. And what the judge was saying is, look, doesn't take much, just something of value. The judge is saying, I'm not here to see if this is a fair deal. I'm not seeing that, you know, if, if Olivia says, I'm going to sell you my car for $10,000 and Antoinette says, um, well, I'll give you my motorcycle for a straight exchange for that. And the motorcycles are broken down, doesn't run, might, might be worth a hundred bucks on a good day kind of thing. And, and y'all agree to it. And then Olivia says, well, wait a minute, that wasn't fair. That wasn't right. I just sold a $10,000 car and all I got was this hundred dollar piece of junk. <laughs> Antoinette like that. She made, <laughs> she made a good deal. Well, if she sued to say, I want to set this aside. I don't want this, this thing to work. Um, judge, she, she needs to pay me $9,900. The judge is going to say, no, that's not my deal. I don't care if it's fair or not. That's not what I'm considering. I'm just looking to see, was there consideration? Was there something of value that passed between Olivia and Antoinette? And if there is, fine. The deal is a valid deal. It's a valid contract. So keep that in mind. I'll often ask a question like, does a judge weigh the consideration to see if it's fair or adequate or something like that? And the answer to that's always false. No, the judge doesn't do that. All the judge does to look to see if there is any consideration, even a mere peppercorn can su be sufficient consideration to support a contract. Y'all know what a peppercorn is? It's that, it's those little things in, you know, y'all go to those nice restaurants. I go to McDonald's. They don't have that. They got the little pepper packets, but y'all go to the nice restaurants where they've got these pepper shakers and the pepper grinders where they grind the pepper and, and the pepper kind of flakes off on your food. Those are peppercorns. Yeah. That's what it, what he's saying. It's just a peppercorn, just that little bitty thing. It doesn't take much. It, it, it takes almost nothing, but it takes something, something of value. So watch out for my test question there. Y'all are going to be ahead of the game and anybody that watches this on uh, recording. I have a quick question before we move on. Sure. That's what I'm here for. Um, I remember you said a couple of like two lectures ago that usually like a verbal um, agreement is contract enough. Would that, is that still the same case for consideration? It, it is, it is. A verbal contract is a valid contract in most cases. There's, there's some exceptions um, that you'll be testing on under the statute of frauds. But um, consideration must still exist. You know, we can agree that I sell my laptop to you and never put anything in writing. And that's perfectly fine. It's perfectly legal, perfectly valid. Um, I cannot agree, we cannot agree to buy and sell a house and that be enforceable because under the statute of frauds, which we may touch on, but you certainly are going to be tested on. Uh, any contract that has to do with real estate must be in writing to be legally enforceable. But consideration in either case must still exist. You've got to have something of value that passes between the two. It doesn't have to pass. And let me make sure that, that I'm, I'm not confused, being confusing here because sometimes I am, especially when I try to do things quickly. 
the something of value that must pass between the parties is the contract itself, not something before the contract. So in the example I gave where Antoinette just made a better deal than, than you did, uh, the something of value that you received was the $100 broken down motorcycle the something of value that Antoinette received was the $10,000 automobile. So each of you received consideration in that contract. Okay. It's just that hers was a little better deal, a lot better deal than yours was. Get her next time. Okay, good question. Um, I don't know how much, if any, I will get involved in past consideration, but uh, in real world stuff, that happens a lot too. Um, I have an agreement to, I'll give you one that's this real life um, agreement. I had an agreement with a client out of town, out of state client to perform legal services for this client on a monthly basis. The agreement was that this client would pay to um, when the bills were submitted. Um, paid one month's bill, did not pay the second month's bill, did not pay the third month's bill. And at that point, I discontinued the services. I don't like to work for free. None of us do, do we? And if that client said, look, I will pay what I owe if you do this other document or this other agreement for me. And I agree to it, which I wouldn't do. But if I did, that agreement would not be enforceable. Why? Because he would be receiving something of value, consideration, I would be performing additional services for him. But what would I be receiving? Money? Well, I was already entitled to that money. So there's nothing new. That's, they call that illusory or past consideration because that's, that's not consideration at all. Uh, a lot of times you'll see that in um, contracts where you have like a uh, construction where a construction company has agreed to do something within a certain time for whatever reason, they are not going to do that within a certain time. But then they say, well, if you pay me extra, then now, yeah, I'll do it. Well, even if they agreed to that, there's no new consideration for that second contract. Remember they already are required to do whatever they're required to do. So just saying, well, yeah, we'll do it now if you pay us more money doesn't mean that you're getting any new consideration or really any consideration for that second contract. Your consideration was the first contract where they agreed to do those services in the first place. I sometimes test on that. Okay. I'm not going to spend any time tonight on, on mental incompetence, but I would urge you to kind of go through these because I'm almost, I'll spend a minute or so talking about it. These are more examples of contracts, depending upon how someone is declared mentally incompetent or how they, you determine that they're mentally incompetent will dictate whether the contract is a valid contract, a void contract, or a voidable contract. I might sneak a question on a test and say, someone who's mentally incompetent can never enter into a valid agreement, and that's false. Or uh, a contract entered into by someone mentally incompetent is always void. That's false. Uh, it's sometimes void. It's sometimes voidable. And it's sometimes valid. It just depends. What does it depend on? Well, they're listed there. 
I'll kind of hit them quickly. I, audio lecture, I think, does a decent job of, of uh, this as well. If a contract is entered into with a person who has been declared by a judge to be mentally incompetent, that contract's void. When a judge declares someone mentally incompetent, they take away all their rights to enter into a contract. They can't do it anymore. So any contract that they enter into, even if it's a fair contract, even if it's beneficial contract, or good, it's void, period. They don't have the power anymore to enter into that agreement. So what about someone that hasn't been declared by a judge to be mentally incompetent? Well, in that case, it could be either valid or voidable. If that mentally incompetent person doesn't really understand what they're entering into, the consequences of that agreement, the nature of that agreement, the purposes of it, the consequences of it, et cetera. They just don't really understand. They're just signing some piece of paper. If that's the case, that contract, and again, this is only for someone who's mentally incompetent, but they have not been declared mentally incompetent by a judge. If they don't understand the nature and consequences of that contract, that contract is voidable. What does that mean? It means that the mentally incompetent person or someone acting for them can get out of it. They can either enforce it if they want to, or they don't have to enforce it. They can back out and say, nope, I'm mentally incompetent. I don't have the ability to understand what this contract was about. Very dangerous situation to get into if you enter into a contract with someone who's mentally incompetent, who hasn't been declared mentally incompetent. They have all the power in that case. Well, what about the third one? The third one, the final one. If you have, and this one's a rare one, this is the most rare, someone who is mentally incompetent for whatever reason, they believe they can fly, they believe whatever, they just don't have any clue about what's going on, but they understand that they just signed a contract to buy that car for $10,000, they needed transportation. To, they, uh, they had the ability to understand what a $10,000, what a car was worth. They had the ability to understand and did understand uh, where $10,000 was coming from, what it meant to them, how much maybe uh, it's ten thousand dollars. I've got twenty thousand dollars in the bank. It's half of what I what I have, but I need transportation. If all those things happen and they haven't been declared mentally incompetent by a judge, then that contract is valid. It can be enforced by either side, by both sides. It cannot be backed out of by the mentally incompetent person. Why? because they had the ability to understand and did understand the nature and consequences of that contract, and they weren't declared legally incompetent by a judge. So keep that in mind. I like to ask questions on that too. You probably are getting an idea by now where I like to ask questions on these fact hypothetical situations, and uh, ones like this are just ideal for it. And, and and often on something like this, it's not just one question I'll ask, but it's two or three or four questions. So just beware. Okay, that's all about forming a contract. I'm gonna back out of this now. And I wanna go back to this mailbox rule. Mailbox rule, I will tell you this, don't spend hours and hours trying to study the mailbox rule. You could do it. I'll ask some questions, you know, a question or two about the mailbox rule. I do think it's important, 
but I also think it can get complicated and it's easy to lose track of where you are in the process. Basically, the mailbox rule is a way of deciding which comes first in given situations. You know by now that an offer can be revoked before it is accepted. You know that offers must be living and breathing if, in order to be accepted. They can't be revoked. They can't be terminated due to lapse of time or due to a uh, contractual time period you put in there. They can't be terminated through rejection or a counteroffer if you want to try to accept it. So the mailbox rule works hand in hand with this, and it can get to some very complicated situations. I've given two examples in this mailbox rule handout, but if you really wanted to understand it, you'd do 20 examples and just kind of run through them in different ways. The general rule is for a contract to exist, you've got to have the acceptance of an offer before it's revoked. We know that already. Well, the mailbox rule applies two things. It applies a rule related to when a revocation is effective and when an acceptance is effective. You know, if we're sitting here or standing in front of each other and you provide an offer to me, and before I accept it, you take it back. Well, we see that. That's easy. It's immediate. We know. The mailbox rule isn't about that. It's about making offers and acceptances and revoking things through the mail originally, but now also including via fax, if they have fax machines, via email, which everybody just about does uh, these days, et cetera. Different ways other than face-to-face. -face. It's actually rare now that you have these deals made face-to-face. -face. So mailbox rule is probably more important today than it was when it was initially developed. You've got two rules, revocation rule and the acceptance rule. Revocation rule is easy peasy, super easy. A revocation, when is a revocation of an offer effective? Only when it is received. That's an always rule. So if I revoke my offer and I mail it to you or email it to you or fax it to you, that offer is still living still breathing. It hasn't died yet until the revocation gets to you. Now, again, if we're face to face, the revocation gets to you immediately. But if we're not face to face and I just go to the old good old U.S. Postal Service and I stick my revocation in the mail and put a stamp on it, throw it in the mailbox, you may not get it for two, three, four, five days or more. And that, rev, that offer, even though I've tried to revoke it, is still living. It's still breathing. It can still be accepted until you get the revocation in the mail or however you get it. Email, fax, carrier pigeon, doesn't matter. That's the easy part. The acceptance rule is different. The acceptance rule is one of those great it depends rules. It depends on when and where and how. And acceptance, you have to go back to the original offer that's made. I send you a proposal, an offer. And I say in my proposal or offer that, hey, if you accept this, if you agree with it and you want to accept, and remember, for valid acceptance, it's got to be the mirror image rule. 
See how I can combine these things into really neat hypotheticals? You know I'm vicious. You know I'm going to like to do that. If I send the proposal and I say, if you agree with it and you want to accept, you must reply back by return email, by fax, by letter, snail mail. Whatever way I tell you to respond is called the authorized means of communication. And if you use that authorized means of communication, then when you send it, when you transmit it, when you first let it go, that's effective. Your acceptance is effective right then, right there. So what if, I don't know, what if uh, on Monday, I made this, this offer and I said, uh, reply back by return snail mail if you want to accept it. And on Tuesday, you put an acceptance in the mail, which obviously I don't get Tuesday. And on Wednesday, I send over a fax to you or an email and say, I, I revoke my offer. Well, that revocation is effective when I receive it, which would be on Wednesday. When would the acceptance be effective? Well, since I told you to send it to me by mail, by snail mail, and since you did it by snail mail, then it's effective Tuesday, even though I don't have it yet. It's still effective because that's what the mailbox rule allows. It says the Acceptance is effective immediately if the authorized means of communication is used. Kind of sounds silly because here you've got a revocation received before an acceptance is received. Most people who don't study the law would think the revocation must be the one that rules because it was received first. Nope. Not under the law, it's a valid contract because the acceptance is effective immediately when it's sent, revocation only when it's received. Now that's only if the authorized means of communication is used. Please go through some examples with, with that. I intend to test on it. What if instead you decided, hey, I think I'm going to get that to him quicker. Mail takes three days to get across town. I'm not going to send that to him on Tuesday because he won't get it till Friday. I'm not going to do that. What I'll do instead is I'll have it hand delivered to him on Wednesday. I've got somebody going over by his office. I'll just have them hand deliver my acceptance on Wednesday. Well, guess what? Now, even though you get my acceptance sooner, since you did not use the authorized means of communication, it's not effective until you receive it. Well, I received your revocation on Tuesday. Which one is effective first? The revocation. In that case, even though I got your acceptance earlier than the other, other one, there's no contract. Aren't these cool? Can you see why I really enjoy asking exam questions like this? I like to test you on, on these. These are fun. Go through the examples if you would. Again, I'm probably two questions on, on this, so I wouldn't just knock myself out and spend 20 hours studying this this thing because it's only going to be two questions out of you know 40 or so but uh it's still going to be two questions so get it right if you can i'd, I'd spend some time and, and kind of go through that okay um let me uh briefly talk about a couple of things on contract breach and remedies and then i'll let you guys go for tonight
And by me going through a lot of these things, do not by any means think they're not important. I'm not, you know, there's some will test on a lot of it, but I want to hit a couple of high points. Statute of frauds being one of them. And I'll tell you what I usually will ask about is those first two and the last one. I don't think I've ever talked about either one of those issues that's uh, that I just highlighted. Any contract involving real estate must be in writing to be enforceable. So you want to buy somebody's house, sign a written purchase and, and sale document. Got to. Contracts involving the one-year rule. I don't remember if I told the story on that. Um, I've got a neat little story, but it'll take more time tonight than I want to involving a uh, lifetime contract. But basically, the contracts involving the one-year rule means this. Any contract that can't be completed within one year must be in writing to be legally enforceable. So if you hire me for three years to perform marketing services for your business, that contract, to be legally enforceable must be in writing. Why? Because you can't make, you can't do a three-year contract in one year, in less than a year. Any contract whose terms must, cannot be completed within one year must be in writing. I'm a sports guy. I like to talk about sports contracts. So if you're talking about LeBron James uh, contract or Nick Saban's coaching contract for a five-year deal, it's got to be in writing to be legally enforceable. Handshake deal is not enough. Um, and I'll briefly mention this. A lifetime contract, interestingly, it's not, I'm going to call it an exception. It's kind of like an exception to that rule. Why? Say you hire me to do uh, enforcement, uh, be head of security for your business. Uh, and you guarantee me a contract for life and we shake on it. We don't put it in writing. There's nothing in writing. Does that violate the one year rule? Well, you have to really think hard here. Can a lifetime contract be completed within one year? The answer to that is yes. You can die. If the person dies within one year, they have completed that lifetime contract. And because it is capable of being completed within one year, then it does not have to be in writing to be legally enforceable. And the example I've got so where a former student of mine actually became a lawyer and uh, tried a case involving head of security and a guaranteed lifetime contract that was not in writing, and she won. She was successful in proving that they, in fact, had a lifetime contract. And so when the person was fired, they were entitled to a lot of damages. I think that one's really neat. Okay, let me see. I'm almost done. There's one or two things I want to hit. Anticipatory repudiation. I had this um, in another matter uh, recently, but basically anticipatory repudiation means this. If you're told in advance or you know in advance that the other side is going to breach the contract, you're not in, you're not required to perform your portion of the contract. Example, I agree to sell you 500 bushel, bushels of corn and you need it for Friday because you, you need to use the corn to feed your livestock. I don't know. 
on Thursday, I tell you, hey, I'm not going to be able to deliver your 500 bushels of corn on Friday. I'll have it for you in a couple of weeks. Well, your livestock's got to eat. But whatever you're going to pay me for that corn, you can't, I mean, does, do you think the law would really require you to have to pay me first and then come back and sue me later? No, the law says you don't have to because one breach excuses the other breach. And when I told you that I couldn't deliver the 500 bushels of corn at the agreed upon time, then I'm in breach of the contract. It's called an anticipatory repudiation, means in advance kind of thing. I'm repudiating the contract. At that point, you're free to say, look, forget it. I'm not paying you either. I'm going to go find it somewhere else. Okay, there's one other thing that I want to... I think we've talked about contracts before, contract damages. Maybe we haven't, but they're like negligence cases. You're only entitled to compensatory damages. You know, in intentional torts, you're entitled to punitive damages. So some people think, well, wait a minute. What if they're breaching that contract on purpose? I'm not going to pay you. doesn't matter. You can still only receive compensatory damages just like a negligent tort. Okay, here's the, I think this is the last thing that I want to talk to you about uh, tonight, and that's the difference between liquidated damages and penalties. It's a question of degree. In a contract, you can have a provision that says, well, if party A doesn't live up to their bargain, then they must pay X. The law says that's fine. You can do that if that's designed to be a replacement for whatever damages you've really suffered. So let's say that now I usually use the a house example just because it's easy. Um, you're a house, you're a general contractor, and you agree to build a house for me and to have it ready by July 1 or else. And the or else is for every day that goes past July 1, you agree to pay me $100 in damages. Basically, I'm reducing my purchase price $100 for every day that you're late. That would probably be liquidated damages, damages designed to just estimate what really you suffer to replace the damages that you've otherwise had. Uh, what are you going to have to do? Well, you got to have a place to live. Maybe you've sold your house. Maybe you got to rent a hotel room. Maybe you got to put stuff in storage. I mean, $100 a day is probably cheap when you think about it. Well, let's say that instead of $100 a day, we said, wait a minute, if you don't have it ready, I really want my $200,000 house to be ready on July 1. If you don't have it ready on July 1, for every day that you're late, $25,000 comes off the purchase price. That ought to be a nice incentive, right? Problem with that is a court's going to look at that as a penalty. And even though courts allow parties to contract with each other, usually they call it freedom of contract, in some situations, they say, no, public policy is just not going to let us, uh, shouldn't allow us to include that type of provision in a contract. Uh, you've got some that are against public policy. Well, a penalty provision kind of falls in that same sort of category. It's against public policy, 
It's a penalty. It's not really designed to punish. It, I mean, not really designed to compensate you for your losses or damages. Uh, I mean, you can get a pretty nice hotel for 25 grand a night, right? Uh, it's not really designed to do that. It's designed to punish you and make sure that you comply with the contract. That's a penalty. Penalty provisions are unenforceable. It's usually a question of degree. And if I put a hypothetical on the, the exam, it'll be obvious. It'll be obvious. That's the best that I can tell you. Uh, it'll be an obvious penalty or obviously it replaces the damages or I'll explain that it, that it replaces or approximates the amount of damage that you're suffering or something. So you can figure out whether it's a liquidated damages provision or a penalty provision. Okay. Well, uh, I didn't live up to my 45 minutes, but I did keep it just under an hour. So I'm going to call that a win. <laughs> do, do you, uh, either of y'all have any questions and thank y'all for, for, uh, for being with me tonight. Appreciate it. It does help when y'all are here and as an active audience kind of thing. No question. Oh, I think we're fine. Oh, I think I'm fine. Okay, good, good. Well, very good. Well, I appreciate it. Um, y'all have a good rest of the night. Try to stay, uh, try to stay dry. I'm looking at my window. 